you and I've been doing a fair amount of traveling lately. And because of that, I guess we're bumping into more and more stories that at least catch our eye about <laughs> what the hell's going on in aviation. And we we saw a story where both of us kind of stopped in our tracks. Well, wait, 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 wait. We and saw everybody lots saw of, this. Yeah, lots I of mean, stories. Come on. Sure. Bolts falling off, doors, doors popping open. All but of that's this crap the happened. one that got me that an Alaska Airlines flight and the, uh, 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 on, a, on a 737 MAX 9, a 737 MAX 9, um, is at 16,000 feet or so. And apparently what they do is they refit this airplane. So that which was a doorway, they took the doorway off and put in what they're calling a plug. Now, the only plugs I know go into outlets and bathtub drains, and they come out really easy. And also into hair, <laughs> into, into bald hair. And, right. And they and don't sometimes they don't work. take. They, yeah, <laughs> That's exactly. right. Sometimes they don't take. And this plug on this 747, 737, sorry, Max 9 at 16,000 feet decided to give it up. It just kind of popped out. See you later. <laughs> and I believe while no one was hurt or killed, thank God, it, I love this line, it sucked the shirt off of a nine-year-old boy. <laughs> Just took and the by the shirt way, when they say nobody right was, off his body, and I'm going, was it an over the head? Was it a button up? What? And what? you know what's amazing? The next time that kid has to fly with his mother, how does yeah. she say nothing's going to happen? Because the kid's going to go, and right. you can bleep this. I'll tell you something else. You, you sit, sit by the window. The friggin', yeah, you the sit by the window. <laughs> and by the way, do they have to do a, a new thing now where they they go up to people who are sitting in an aisle that's not emergency and go, hi. This used to be an emergency row in case the thing blows out. Will you right. assist people getting? Yeah. Right. Will you grab the kid's yeah. shirt? This could <laughs> become an emergency row <laughs> when you least expect it. So the deal is, and, and I got I to gotta expand a bit. So producer David reminded me of this documentary about Boeing and the Max airplane right. and how it came about and what it is. And we're going to talk about that a little bit with our guest who excites you because you love Richard Quest, who was the CNN I, aeronautics now, correspondent. I, just say, and I, I don't think I stand alone in this, right? I, I uh, Richard Quest, the man could be talking about uh, ice melting somewhere, but the enthusiasm and the yep. passion, the excitement makes me go, I should be caring about this. This is important stuff. There's uh, there's something about him that I just find. So so today's question yeah, that we're going to get great. to, f and then we will decide if we got an answer is, yeah. are they putting unsafe planes in the sky? And I've yeah. got some stuff to tell you to start this, that airlines, some secrets airlines may not tell you. Because why would they? Here you go. Are they telling me any secrets, by the way? You said some secrets. Not a lot. Well, they tell you some stuff. I mean, they By they the very include... nature of a secret, why would they tell me? That's there you go. All okay. Right. So we're gonna we're gonna do this if you want to hear. Go ahead, Captain Redundancy. <laughs> go ahead. Oh my gosh. Here we go. <clears throat> They're kind of stingy when it comes to fuel, because it saves money keeping low levels of fuel. So if you hit an unexpected weather delay, yeah, or something happens, there's rough weather. They got to go down. They got to land because they're running out of gas. They didn't anticipate another 25 minutes in the air. So it's like, we got to put it down. Yeah. There's a do not pair list. Do you know that pilots and co-pilots fill out a list of people they don't want to fly with because they don't want insanity and two adversaries flying in the cockpit constantly. So you put down on your uh, list who you don't want to fly with. Everybody very puts down who they don't want to fly with. Uh, I wonder if it's like, Everyone says Peter, so he has to fly alone. Like, alone, yeah, he's not. Can a solo you imagine? Pilot. But yeah, they That's have a very do interesting. I really wonder if I could really. get that in my uh, in one of my clauses in my contract. Do not act do not with. pair. <laughs> do not pair. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Because you don't want two guys who hate each other's guts because of yeah, something. Absolutely. By the way, when there's a death on board, do you know the protocol? Uh, when someone dies on board, mm -hmm. the protocol doesn't happen often. But if there's a long transatlantic flight, they got to deal with it. Uh, is it like an Irish wake? They put it in the aisle and everybody sings songs and makes a tribute? Or I don't know. No. 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 So they bump it to first class, first of all. The body goes to first class. The body goes to first class if there's an open seat and they put a, a blanket over it. If not, they put a blanket over it. Singapore Airlines, however, has a room called the Corpse Corpse mm. Cupboard. So if anybody anybody dies, you at sure. least get your own. You get your own. Little, you finally, yeah. I finally got the first. What do you think the situation was where somebody at Singapore Airlines went? You know what we need? We need a corpse covered. This, I mean, this is getting out of hand. <laughs> well, that person, by the way, 
one of the corpse cupboards so they can rest in there if it's not in use. You know right, what I mean? Exactly. It's rare. So oh, here's I the one. Yeah. Here's the one, and I'm sure you're going to want to bring this up with our guest. Um, and I, I tipped this the other day like an idiot when I was talking about the show for a minute. Do you know where most airplane repairs or a lot of the airplane repairs are done? Oh, well, you told me, so I'm, I'm going to play so, stupid. So the answer where, for those Peter? listening, the really no really is Costa Rica, China, Ethiopia, Argentina, Kenya, El Salvador, and Indonesia, among the countries, the mechanics who deconstruct and reassemble planes, this is where they take, take them apart and put them back together, and overwhelmingly are not certified by the FAA, and the majority also don't speak fluent English, which wouldn't normally be a problem, except all the technical manuals for airlines are written, and airplanes and wiring stuff are written in English, as are all flight okay. materials. So wait they have, wait, my, my they also just, don't have inspector, but they don't yeah. have... Yeah. Supposedly, they don't have enough FAA inspectors over sure. there, whatever. So yeah. they're outsourcing to other countries. Yeah. And it's in, it's increasing. we got to ask Richard about that. i got to push back on you with the manual because my dust buster came with a manual that's in seven languages. I find it hard to believe that a Boeing ask 737 Richard. didn't come with, a, with more than one language. The maintenance the manuals manual. are written in English. It's every article I've read says that. So clearly, you and I have a lot that we don't know and have experienced in the wonderful world of aviation. And you went and got us uh, a gentleman who's, who really is well-versed and an expert in many, many areas. But uh, Richard Quest is, among his many other credit, credits, he is he, he's basically the airline and aviation correspondent at CNN. He's covered a, a number of breaking aviation stories, like, like the downing of the Malaysia Airlines flight in the Ukraine and uh, the Virgin Galactic uh, Spaceship Two crash and the disappearance of the Malaysia Airlines flight. Right, right. Uh, he wrote a book about that called The Vanishing of Flight MH370, the true story of the hunt for the missing Malaysian plane. So I, I find him fascinating, uh, as I know you do too. He, he began his career and still has a, a huge career as a business correspondent for the BBC and CNN. I actually adore his, uh, his travel show on CNN. The man is very polite and very elegant, very British. So let's let's pull it together. Let's be classy and let's this, welcome. This is, this is good as good as I was just about to do it. I was just about to say it. I know. I and heard. let's welcome Mr. Richard Quest. Really? No, really. Really? No, really. Really? So. Let's welcome Mr. Richard Quest. Yay! Welcome to Really No Really, well, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm delighted. Uh, I love a man who wears suspenders. You know, the suspenders, the suspenders I've worn, I started wearing them in the late 1980s. I think it was largely Greed is Good, Wall Street, Michael Douglas. <laughs> you know, and you've got to, by the way, you've got to make sure they're, they, they've got buttons, not clips. But not clips. And once you've worn suspenders for a while, you realize they're so much more comfortable than belts. They are. They very much are. But it was an arrogance of precociousness that first led me. I to love it. that you that you go deep, that you go deep, and you you know why and when and the feeling <laughs> of when you want launch it. By the way, did you did you have a bad experience with a clip on suspender? Because you immediately uh, th th that you poo pooed the clip on immediately. You know, <laughs> it's a bit like plastic glasses. You know, sure. You just, I understand. A little day class. Say, I understand. The real ones. Are, if you want to be greedy, is good. They've got to have buttons. I, I thoroughly agree. So, Richard, first of all, because you've done business for so long, we may talk about the Royals sure. a little bit later on, but airline, because you are the guy, yeah. you've interviewed all the CEOs. Or what, are you that fascinated with flying? Is it something that you love so much? I know that you probably come back and forth at least once or twice a month. This week I've done, or the last couple of weeks, I've done Mexico, Dubai, Doha, Sydney, and then I got back into New York yesterday. I, 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 a grave risk of, of ruining. Just sort of, just bear with me a minute. So can you sure. see the planes? We do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A tabletop. That There are plane souvenirs all around um, my office. Um, and whenever I know, the reason is simple. So I, I can give you a, 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 a practical reason. Why? Because they are vast economic engines you don't have one person answering the phone you have hundreds of call centers that plane think about it. let me just take one aircraft let me take a oh i don't know let's just do a, 
a lot, foolish lot of airlines. There you go. Now, you think about that one aircraft. It's got to get the right crew with the right passengers and the right luggage and the right meals in the right place for the right slot at the right time. And you've got to do it hundreds of times a day. And if you're talking about, let's say, United or Delta, thousands of times a day. And I was just looking only yesterday, because I really am that sad, at the number of passengers that United flew in 2023. You're talking about over 160 million. And if you look at Ryanair in Europe, 180 million odd passengers. I mean, so they are. They, so these these machines, besides being beautiful, they fly. Uh, but but my point is that these things are magic. They fly. They are vast economic engines in their own right. They are geopolitical. What other industry gets affected by war, volcanoes, economic growth, um, uh, pandemics in 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 manifestations? And the aircraft industry or the aviation, the airline industry, simply touches every te tentacle of the global economy. And that I find fascinating. Are you also a pilot? Do you, no. Do you fly? Unfortunately, one or two health issues mean that um, it, it, there's just too many restrictions. That we do. And believe me, I have flown planes in simulators and you wouldn't want to be sitting in first class with champagne no 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 i, I thoroughly understand <laughs> oh, look i love planes as a kid i used to go i lived in philly i used to go to yeah. philadelphia international airport with yeah. my brother and stand there and watch them yep. for hours landing and taking off but the question today i guess to get right to it and and i'll let you get everybody listening up to speed so there's incidents that keep happening bolts 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 falling off etc um, and problems. We have one one executive who said he won't fly. He actually got off the the seven what is seven thirty seven yeah max because because he said it's just they should be grounded based on this software program that they didn't allegedly or maybe they proved it didn't tell the pilots about. So we watched the documentary. We've seen what happened with the merger of um, the two airlines, McDonnell Douglas, and and you know. Boeing, which was the gold center, I guess. But can you get people up to speed about where we are today with the merger and the bolts and the falling and the two flights going down within five months? If you could take everybody through what the problems were leading of up course. to so The 737, uh, the MAX, the decision to create the MAX, they had a choice, Boeing. They were falling dangerously behind Airbus, which had the A320 family of planes. A320 had come up with the NEO, which is the new engine option, which is basically the engine was giving about 15 to 20% better fuel efficiency. And it was going to cost too much money for Boeing to redesign the 737 from scratch. This is a plane, by the way, going back to the 1960s. So they did what they always did. They bolted bits on, they changed things around, they extended it. They did this, that, and the other. But what they did was unconscionable because they added a piece of software that was perfectly legitimate. Absolutely. In fact, Airbus has always had this software. It basically means that the plane can't crash. It basically means that if a situation happens, the aircraft will do something in its own right to prevent you from stalling and crashing. And Boeing had always gone, ha, ha, we'll never put that on our planes. We will never have. You know, to re um, auto law will never do it because we believe that Boeing, the pilots in charge, we believe that Boeing, that if, you know, sorry, I hope they're getting all excited at the prospect of this. We believe that Boeing, you know, the famous saying, if it ain't a Boeing, I ain't going. Well, guess what? With the 737, they redesigned the plane in such a way that the engines were further forward and were higher up and were more powerful, and there was a real risk that the plane could stall. Exactly what they did was so they put into place this little bit of software called MCAS, maneuvering something, something, something. But what this bit of software did was say, in a certain situation, if certain circumstances happen, we will fly the plane regardless. All right. Now, I'm going to let me find the 7-3. I don't know what 7-3 is. Yeah. 
but I better not use one of those because it's not in blurry colours and they'll get cross. Um, you've got to be very careful when you use little ones. So with both the Ethiopian um, and the other one, what, what happened was in both of these cases, in both crashes, that the pilots, well, the first crash, they didn't know. The first crash, they didn't even know this thing existed. There was a fault. The thing, and the second crash, they knew it existed. But what we learned then is you had to respond so bloody quickly. If you did not respond, Boeing said pilots should recognize, pilots should recognize that this is a runaway stabilizer situation. And in that situation, you go to page 4916 and you follow this on the list <laughs> and you do this, 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 and this. And if you've done all of this, you'd have been fine. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. And they were right. But what happened with the second crash is that they did realize, because by then they knew about it, and they did realize it was this situation, and they did it, and they still crashed. And the reason was you had 10 seconds. You had 10 seconds to do it before it was irrecoverable. And that is why, and, and, and you know, and so I'm rambling on, but I can come back to it. I can really bring my anger to Boeing down to this. When all was said and done and the changes were made and we saw what they did to MCAS, do you know what they did? They made MCAS. They followed their own creed. They made it so it was never too powerful for a pilot to overwhelm. They made it so that it wouldn't do it far again and again and again, so that a pilot could take back control. They added redundancy to when it would kick in. Instead of just having one sensor, they added two sensors. And they made sure pilots knew about it and how to counteract it. Now, those sound really simple, but those things were the creed of Boeing going back to when they, to when they started making planes. And it was the creed that they had forgotten. And we know the reasons why. Because they didn't want pilots to have to retrain on the 737 MAX because they committed to airlines that no retraining would be necessary. So if I'm on a 737 MAX tomorrow, am I reasonably assured that the pilots have the training and they know how to deal with the system? I was the on one last week. And uh -huh. what a magnificent aircraft it is. It is beautiful. It is. It flies comfortably. It's got tremendous power. MCAS is still there, but MCAS has been now put into its proper box. So the pilots know about it. The pilots have been trained on it. And even if, even if MCAS fires wrongly, MCAS was pushing the nose down. It was at such a force that the pilots physically couldn't pull it back. Now it can't do that. It can only push it down a bit. The pilots can pull it back up. If it goes wrong, it'll do it again. The pilots can pull it back. After three goes, MCAS switches off. MCAS can no longer be the, uh, the, the runaway Frankenstein that it was. Pilots are back in control. The, the 737 Boeing built a beautiful plane. And if my anger with them is anything, is that they screwed it up for themselves by not telling the pilots and telling people, and of course, by lying to regulators. In the opening, Jason yeah. and I were talking about things that you may not know about airlines and that they outsource repair to countries. Um, I don't know how much, but it seems like they're doing it more and more to save money where the first language is not necessarily English and all the manuals are in English, all the services is English, and they may not even be FAA regulated because they don't have the people there to actually oversee the work. Is that still happening, Richard? Is Can that growing? Is that is that? Dimension? I'm going to stop you there. It's an absolute load of old bollocks. Oh, good. Thank no, goodness. no. Of course they're outsourcing. Of course they're outsourcing to places where it can be done more efficiently, where it can be done cheaper. But your question doesn't go to that. Your question goes to standards of the repair. Right, and, right. Yeah, all right. So we had this with Qantas in Australia who got terribly hot under the collar 
where their engineers, because Qantas was sending it off their planes off to Malaysia to be repaired. Well, what, what arrogance, what Western arrogance that says, oh, no, we can't send it to those countries because they may not be able to understand how to repair. Absolute bollocks. No. The United sends its planes off. Delta sends its planes off. You send your planes off to where the repair can be done in the most cost-effective, efficient, and safe way. Now, can that always be done in home, in the United States, in the EU? No, because cost of labor is higher. Your next question, Jason, is, ah, but how can we be sure that if it goes to Malaysia, Come on. The answer is you have to put in place in these places proper protections, proper safety regulations, and these places have to be certified to do the repairs at the same standard. But this idea that somehow a plane can't fly to Singapore to be repaired. No, actually, my next question was going to be, doesn't it disturb you that Peter would just <laughs> be so dismissive of, of right. you know, no, 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 here's, here's actually, here's, right. here's, let me, no, let I can hear, give, we, we all heard the tone, Peter, you, we heard the tone. Let me give you an example. <laughs> let me give, let me give you an example, right? How many of you, you know, can you imagine a time when you're, oh, I'm not having those French making planes, they'll be too busy with their garlic. To be making the planes properly, and as for, I mean, it'll it'll smell. All right, all right, everybody, calm down. Everybody, yeah. just calm down for a minute, Richard. I had read I continued must. reports because I'm not in the field. I couldn't vet it. That's why we have you on to tell no, us. No, Peter, Peter, we know why you asked the question. We, Embraer, we see Embraer build magnificent planes down in Brazil. I understand. No, I. Th I salute them. You've I understand, you, Peter. You, you have a valid give... point. You have a valid point, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. And it is Thank this, that you. where an airline chooses to outsource, it's, and it tends to be the heavy maintenance, the big stuff, you know, that's going to take a month. Where they choose to outsource heavy maintenance to an MRO that's not in the jurisdiction, then yes, the regulator does have a duty to make sure it's being done to the, but, but, hang on. Well, don't make that face again. But the I arrogance, mean, Peter. The arrogance, the sheer no, arrogance. I had an obligation to Shame on you. Shame. shame. If I had a bell, I'd be ringing it. Shame. Sh way, I'd walk you naked through a it. crowd. He'll be, go, he'll be <laughs> there it is. This. There I'm it cutting. is. I tell you, I tell you, I would, and I would agree with all that you say, except the fuselage on the 737 MAX was built by Spirit. It was transported across to Boeing's factory. It was assembled in Boeing's factory. The door was removed. The door was put on. The bolts were left off. And the rest is history. So, yeah. you know, I mean. And a little boy's shirt was no, lost. No, that's, no, that's what no. happened. Jason, that shirt wasn't lost. That shirt was was dragged off by wind. Can you imagine? And I know. We know this from, by the way, I don't want to get really unpleasant about this, but we know this from plane crashes, which have depressurized at, at height, that often the bodies are naked, uh, God forbid. Yeah. And it's because, the, 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 look, if, if the seatbelt sign had been switched off, and the plane had been higher, and people had been able to walk around the aircraft, we would have lost people. We would have had a catastrophe. Absolutely. So, Richard, so you have reassured me that the, the, the planes are now sound, the pilots are, 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 the maintenance is now sound. So, and the pilots are in control, which now begs the other thing that, that Peter and I have been listening to in, in the articles that we've read, that there seems to be uh, an increase or a preponderance of pilots being asked to work um, truly stressful hours, stressful situations, that mental health among pilots, uh, poor mental health or, or mental health that it, it requires some sort of attention has increased, and that there is really no system in place to assess that. There is not an environment in which it is encouraged for them to come forward with uh, any of their own concerns. And so that the real possibility of 
pilots who are struggling are up in the air. What's what's the take on that? Oh, it's, a, it's a really, really tricky one, Jason. Okay, it goes like this. There are an entire raft of rules. You, you, you've got the regulator, first of all, with an entire raft of rules that you have to follow in terms of mental health, physical health, et cetera, et cetera, the FAA. You've then got all the airlines who have their employee assistant programs. But, but, which pilot wants to go to the company and says, actually, I'm having a few, you know, mental difficulties. Uh, I might need six weeks off to go and do it, uh, but I'll be fine afterwards. Oh, you're going to put him back in the, you know, um, and so and no amount of no amount of um, confidentiality prevents this. So the ability of pilots to reveal a weakness and still get their being able to go back to fly is very very high. So they just don't reveal it at all. And you end up with anonymous reporting. You end up, I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Um, you know, two of the, the worst incidents. Um, well, first of all, any form of substance or alcohol abuse. It's very difficult for pilots to come forward, admit the problem, deal with it, and easily get back in the air. It's possible. It is possible, but it's not easy. And the airlines don't really have full, you know, if I take, I, I've had lots of friends who've been pilots who, one of them, I'll give you an example, one of whom suffered from um, kidney stones. Uh -huh. And I feel for, I feel as well. I, I, yes, he did too. And you can't <laughs> fly with kidney stones. Right. And if you have them treated, the lengths to which you subsequently have to go before you'd be allowed back in the cockpit. Now, in Europe, they have different policies to the United States, to Asia. But what are the policies that an airline has that says, all right, you've got kidney stones, you can no longer fly. But we now have all of these jobs that you can do on land. You know, same salary, same everything. Some do, some don't. Some ha so, so, so the barometer for which you are, are going. There are two. There are two crashes that always give me pause for thought. One goes back many years. It was Coglin. It was um. It was a, a commuter flight. It was going into Buffalo. I think it was Buffalo, where two essentially the. The two pilots, Continental Airlines, I believe, had slept in the restroom before the flight, you know, and they then got on board the plane and they flew it. I'm just saying it was Buffalo. Um, we can always check that. Um, and made some terrible, terrible decisions in bad weather and the plane crashed horrifically. And what came out of that was commuter airline pilots were underpaid, overworked, overstressed, and the whole set of things changed. The second one is Air France 440. Air France 440 was the plane that went from uh, Sao Paulo to, 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 to Paris. It was an A330, brand new plane, lovely plane, gorgeous aircraft. And in the middle of the flight, um, the, the pilot, the captain was back uh, it, it, having his rest. Two pilots at the front. The pitot tube blocked, sent wrong data to the uh, pilots. And the way the pilot flying behaved turned the wing from a knife through butter, a hot knife through butter, to a snowplow. The plane went up, landed in the middle of the ocean. Everybody died. But what was extraordinary about both of them is that they were entirely avoidable. Conklin by more experience and not actually doing the board, being more aware. But Air France 447, 447, just by sitting on their hands. If they'd done nothing, if they had done nothing, the plane would have bounced along 
because the 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 auto throttle rolled back, uh, cut out. The autopilot called back. Yeah, the plane would have checked along a bit, but it would not have gone like that. It would have just bounced along. My point is, we vest these men and women at the front with tremendous authority and power. But I sometimes question whether we give them the mental and physical health and space necessary so that they can also be human beings. Yeah. This is why my mother, and Peter knows this well, back in the days when she was a flyer, a very nervous flyer, the, those were in the days where the cockpit door was open and the captain often greeted uh. the passengers as they boarded the plane. And my mother would stop and have a conversation about, how's your family? Everything good with the wife? You good? Any 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 physical, mental problems coming up? You got she would interrogate him <laughs> until she was comfortable that this man was qualified to fly her. At, you know the thirty minutes she had to get me. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you do look at them. Sometimes you look at Captain Donut going into the cockpit, and you think, you're, yeah, you're you're a coronary waiting to happen. Yeah. Oh, you bet. Yeah. Well, and I look divorces. at I mean, we don't know divorces. We don't know children problems. We don't know. We don't and know. I also don't know what is you know I, you hear about. Oh, the guy had to pull back on the yoke to get the. And I'm going. This guy weighs ninety two pounds. If he pulls back on the yoke, nothing. Or, or this guy. You're right. This guy seems to be a little bit on the morbidly obese. I, I do but, think. I do think that the modern aircraft is so complicated and it requires such different skills. You're not. You, you know, Boeing sort of forgot that with the Max 3. Uh, Airbus has always built its planes. You know, this is a terrible thing to say. Um, but one person once said to me, Airbus does not build its redundancy in planes for the likes of United, Delta and America. It does not build it because they're so well qualified and so well trained, oh, uh -huh. and they are. You know, the, some of the safety precautions to prevent crashing are not designed for the major yes, carriers. They're designed for the developing world, where, where truth be told, standards may be lower, training standards may be lower, and therefore the aircraft does have to sometimes protect the pilot from himself or herself. So let me let me switch to this. So now let's go into the cabin. Maybe I'm just aware of it because those stories break through. But there seems to be a greater preponderance of of passenger outbreaks or passenger rage in the air. And I, I understand we live in stressful times, and so there may be more people flying with mental health issues and whatnot. And then, but yeah. there also seems to be no, you know, everybody's got a system. If this happens, you do this. If this happens, you do this. But there doesn't seem to be a quantified protocol for when somebody loses it up in the air. Am I right? Am There's I wrong? There's two types of losing it. There's losing it because of the mentally disturbed or the, uh, the challenged. There's losing it because we are now seeing just simple rudeness. Rudeness. This, a lot of what you're talking about can be put down to courtesy. Courtesy, politeness, and respect for public transportation. That, that, that's what this is, a plane. It is public transportation. You are sharing the space with other members of the public. It, you may have paid $10,000 for your ticket, but the person next to you has also done. So I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. The person who has their headphones on too loud. This is not, this is just rudeness. And the person who shoves their way and takes all the overhead space and doesn't want to move any of it to make room for you. The person who spreads out meaninglessly and thoughtlessly. This is not, this is, this is, this is what your mother taught you to behave with courtesy. And I, you know, I flew back yesterday from, um, I went Sydney to Doha, Doha to Sharjah, Dubai to New York. And you know, it's a 15 hour flight from Dubai to New York. But everybody was very kind, respectful. Oh, do you mind? Oh, I'm terrorist. Oh, do be careful. Now, of course, I'm British. So if, if, you, know, <laughs> if, if you step on my foot, I will apologize to you. Uh, of of course, course, yes. But it just requires a bit of courtesy. By the way, 
there's a lot of a kayak did an, a, an etiquette survey recently about you know who owns the middle seat armrests well <laughs> yes <laughs> my husband all right I'm, I'm, you, 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 you're going to need to just picture this my husband has never forgiven me imagine i didn't have my sock on right Im to do this properly. Hang on. My husband has never, we're in business class and I'm sitting there reclining watching the movie and I want to turn the volume up and so I do this. Use your foot. Oh, use oh. your foot. Oh, he has oh, never sure. forgiven me for touching the screen. And this is why I will <laughs> never touch the volume control if I'm ever allowed to fly in business again. My God. My God. But I want to know why when things go wrong, there isn't like a, a flight attendant with chloroform. It's all like some passenger has a roll of duct tape in his carry-on. Well, they're, 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 they're duct taping the guy to the yeah. seat. Or, well, no, I mean, there just doesn't seem to be. <laughs> no. And where are the air marshals? Aren't there air How many air marshals are in the air? Shouldn't somebody be? <laughs> we don't really know how many there are. We don't know what. I know. None. We apparently. don't know what routes they're on. <laughs> And the, I guess also the air marshal only discloses themselves when they really have to. But but there are things like restraints and um, all that sort of sort of stuff that they, that people can use. It's about, I, I think our number one issue. You're talking about the person who is maybe disturbed or distressed. I think the number one thing that we need to be teaching in schools, besides maths, arithmetic, and some of the basic things, is also courtesy. After you, oh please, no, after you, oh do have another chocolate. You know, um, the, the basic courtesy. So, well, maybe that. Should, yes, maybe that. <laughs> you know, I don't need to know how to operate the life vest. I think I'm going to figure that out. Maybe oh. it should say, "Hey, a nice please, a nice thank you, and excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, if you're climbing over somebody, maybe face them. Don't put your tuchus in their Correct. face. Maybe there's, you oh. know, come on. But you know what, Jay? But it transcends that. My wife and son just flew back east to see family, to see your yeah. dad, who's not well. They sat on the seat, and the woman behind them. Entered the plane, sat down, the door closed, and the woman threw up all over herself. She they had to clean her up. She was drunk out of her mind already yes. before the yeah. plane took off. What's the protocol? So they're Sobriety test the at the door. Sobriety test at the door. Touch your nose, stand on one leg. Can't do it? No, Everybody. can't get on the plane. Every, see, can't get on the so plane. So the boarding will take 17 no, hours. I think, the, I think the answer is you're never going to be able to, I think the, you're never going to be able to deal with that sort of situation. But what you can do, as you say, before you shove your tuchus in somebody's face, just look at them and say, oh, you will excuse me. Oh, well, I just I'm so, or, simply, <laughs> yes. or simply say, I don't think there's any elegant way to do this. And, oh, right. and I tell you what I've also started to do. Brilliant. Brilliant little trick. I, you know those lint chocolate balls? Very nicely. Yes. I always buy a box duty-free and I keep them in my travelling bag. Give them to the woman at check-in. Give them to the flight attendant. Half it's not the whole box. Oh, do have a, yes. do have a chocolate. They will. Yes. Their eyes will light up. They will realize you you're bet. a human being, and suddenly they'll be much nicer to you. I know. I saw a woman give an entire bag of of uh, uh, Mrs. Fields cookie or whatever. Really, home. You know, beautiful cookies. They said, "I, you know what? I, they're not going to make it to the on this trip. Please, I'd like to give it they'll to love the it. Oh and love man, it. I, did they treat yeah. her beautifully? And it's courtesy. It's just good. Old-fashioned courtesy. Yeah, buying We're people out of off it. with. Oh, you are okay, such a miserable. I get you're it. I such get a it. miserable. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, I wrote you, the book. you would have discovered the book. if you didn't pick book. it up during his racist comments about people doing you maintenance. Know, you are so now horrible. you know who this man is. Okay, now you know what I've been doing and all that is not okay. <laughs> so my question to you is: You wrote the book on the missing flight. I was on. I've, I've done a lot of years on radio, and I was on when that happened. And I remember distinctly on CNN the van. Hold it up. The vanishing. A flight, flight MH370? Right, 370 it disappeared. I remember, because we had have experts on, et cetera, I remember Don Lemon at night saying, is it, as he guessed, is it possible that it went into a black hole? That was actually his question. And I think the guest looked at him and went, no. All right, I don't you want the background so. to that? <laughs> yes, but, and also, since you studied it and you wrote the book on it, how is it possible that this thing, are we any closer to an answer? Um, the background to the black hole question was that we were asking for questions from viewers. And a viewer had sent it there in. There you go. And we, did, ah. and we debated it as it came in. And we both thought, do you know something? 
It's so off field. Let's just ask it. Let's, you know, <laughs> let's just ask it. It's so ludicrous <laughs> that we will just ask it. And of course, everybody immediately t- took poor Don to task for it, as if it was. Just, I was uh, curious why it was why. asked. Why? That's why? Because yeah, that's yeah, right. I got it. That's Thank why. you for that. But are we closer? Do we have any sense of what went down? That we have every other flight. You usually get some kind of piece the, of the info. The plane is where they say it is, which is about several hundred miles off the western coast of Australia. We can't find it because, as you know, the bottom of the ocean is just like the land. It's got mountains, it's got valleys, it's got canyons. And this thing went into the ground like uh, intact, uh, into the water. But it, we don't have the sophisticated technology yet to find it. Where I criticise the Malaysian government and others is that there have been several private attempts that have required Malaysian government approval to continue searching. The last one was a few years ago, deep ocean or something. And the Malaysian government uh, withdrew permission to continue. So I do think we'll find out what happened. Um, there's, a, there's a particular captain in Australia who doesn't really like me very much um, because I basically say, we well, first of all, I flew with the first officer, Farik Hamid, two weeks before he flew this flight. Pure luck. Mm. I was filming on a flight to um, Hong Kong, Malaysia Airlines, and he was on the plane. He was flying, and I flew with him, and there's a picture of me sitting next to him. Um, but did the captain, sorry, I did, did he do it? I'm not an idiot. I can see the, I can see, well, some say, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> some I can see the logic that gets you to the captain having done it, but I am not prepared to co- to condemn a captain with a murder of several hundred people without some evidence. And there, frankly, is evidence. And I'll go one more, uh, guys. I'll go one more. Since over the last ten years, yes, different bits have been washed up that have told us how the plane went into the into the water. And yes, we've learned this, that, or the other. But there is not one shred, not one shred of new real evidence that tells us what happened. Ten years on, we are no wiser than we were then. We know how the plane went into the water. We know how it moved. But we do not know what happened in it. Wow. Wow. Or a bridge. All right. I, so... I'm going to now uh, let, let's do the fast ones, Pete. You ready? Safest place to sit on the plane. Average on average. Statistically, the safest place is to, to the back and facing backwards, facing forward. It makes no difference. The reality, the, the reality is if you go into a mountain, it won't matter. This, um, the, but but the Air Force <laughs> always used to say sitting backwards like that is supposed to be safest. And that's because if you have an accident on the ground, but really doesn't matter. Most comfortable okay. seat you could possibly find. You, I love it. Uh, never drink the the unbottled water on an airplane, not even if it's coffee or tea. Why ever not? Uh, I am told that they are kept in these tanks that are never really routinely <laughs> sanitized or cleaned. Bollocks. Or, bollocks. I love that because I'm drinking a lot of bollocks. coffee and tea. It's um, uh, for people who uh, are, are still wearing masks on the plane, is it true that the the uh, interior atmosphere is recirculated something like every seven to ten minutes? No, it's every three minutes. Or is it three or four minutes? Every three minutes. Um, Look, if it's a very busy flight and you are on your way to uh, great Aunt Matilda's 90th birthday party and your entire family is going to be there, then absolutely wear a mask. You've got him, her, her, him, her, she leading over, You've been in close quarters on the jetway, and we do know that COVID is still around. So why would you not take that little bit of extra protection? Because you want to enjoy Great Aunt Matilda's birthday, and more importantly, you don't want to kill her off. Well, you don't know Matilda like I do, but okay. Uh, true or false? If a if a typical airline window were compromised at thirty thousand feet. Am I re- and I'm not and I'm standing nearby. I'm not buckled in. Am I really going out that window? When you say compromised, do you mean blown out completely or cracked? L- let's say blown out. Is there a is there a theoretical risk if you're sitting next to it that you will be sucked out the window 
Yes. If the plane is at 30, is at full pressurization. Yes, it has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody has been pushed and squeezed out of the window. But I, looking at you, gentlemen, I think that, um, thank you. It would have to be 40,000 no, feet minimum no, is what you're saying. Door, <laughs> right. Well, if it's the door, and bear in mind, that, I'll give you another quick myth, quick myth. Can you open the emergency exit in flight? No. And this Can't. is the problem. Right. By the way, this was the problem with the plug door. This is the normally that's the hole. Normally, the emergency door is on the inside, pushing against out. Right. So the air pressure keeps it in place. You can't pull it in. But the plug door was on the outside of the plane, tied on. Therefore, it just blew away. If it had been like oh the emergency exit. It wouldn't have been able to blow off. You cannot. Of open. course. I mean, you can. That's good you to can, know. But good because of the mechanisms. All right. Hip comfort animals. Yes. Anything not going on? Because I, I seem to be sitting next to things that give me no comfort. The airlines have tightened. What, what the are the they? airlines have tightened up greatly, hugely on comfort animals. Uh, it, it, it's, there's got to be a registered one now. It can't just be. A dog. I have seen the most beautiful dogs on planes. Just sitting there. And once I was flying back from the West Coast and the dog that had just won the Westminster, um, whatever it is. Dog show. Wow. Yeah. The big show. Had his own seat in business class. And just looked. God bless. And just looked. I what don't perfect, mind comfort animals. What a good boy. I, what a good boy. I don't <laughs> mind comfort animals. I mind owners that aren't... Oh, courteous that maybe yes. your comfort animal might be distressing most passengers love a comfort animal all right what happens if my uh, phone is not on airplane mode on takeoff and landing is it truly a uh, a danger bollocks no of course it's not what will happen god bless what you. will happen if your <laughs> phone is not on in airplane mode is it will literally search for a signal for the whole flight and when you get there it will be dead Sully Sullenberger, Jason and I go crazy yep. since the man landed yep. a plane, no one died, on water, never been done yep. before, couldn't do it in a simulator, and then he's got to go in and answer a million questions. Shouldn't they have just given him a ribbon, some money, thanked him, a parade, the whole Or bit? could anybody have done it? Is any pilot trained to do okay. this, theoretically? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. They're all trained to land on water. Completely. Sullenberger's genius. Bear in mind, first of all, he was a training captain. Secondly, he was a specialist specialist in safety. So he thought about all these things. It's not like he was your average pilot. He was a training safety person who actually was a consultant on safety. So he knew all about this. His genius, genius, was not doing the landing. His genius was deciding to do the landing. Because here he is, he's been told that Teterborough's there. Could I get back to LaGuardia there? There's Westchester there. What do I, no, he says, no, I'm not going to make it. But there's a perfectly straight stretch in which I can prepare myself to land. And by the way, if you look at the report, you know, the report obviously has to go into the index of it. If you look at the Airbus report, there was about four or five things they did not do according to Airbus. They didn't lock off this particular watertight compartment. They didn't close that one, none of which was terribly significant. But you have to dot I's and cross T's. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. But what he did do was prepare the aircraft and himself mentally for what he was about to do, which was an on-water landing. Now, this wasn't an on-water landing, by the way, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in darkness in the middle of the night. This was right. <laughs> in as near perfect conditions on a smooth piece of water, not taking anything away from him to do it. But his genius was to basically was, say, was committing to it and saying, yeah, right. I'm going to do it. Amazing. That, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I wish you Thank luck. You, and you are, you are, Richard, you know what? You're amazing. Uh, you're, you're I, just a, a passion is what got Jay, Jason. Jason said, Can we get Richard? Do you think we can get Richard to talk about airlines? I said, I don't know. Let's try. Because you're that passionate, and it's great having done this a long time. Jason's done this, hasn't done this as long as I have. Um, he's new to the podcast world and interviewing world, but I've done it for 30 plus years. It's rare that you come along somebody who's not just good at it and informed, but really. I'm afraid, gentlemen, it's the it. questions. You know, I always say, I always say that doing an interview 
is ballroom dancing. And I'll explain what I mean. Bear with me. First, so ballroom dancing. Now, if I come prepared to do a waltz, and my interviewee is going to do a rumba, we will make an enormous amount of heat, but we won't shed any light. And so it is the necessity of you and me being performing the same dance, prepared to dance, doing the same dance. That is the secret to a good interview, I believe. And may I say, as a man who has been paid to dance on a brother's <laughs> stage, you have quite a lovely oh, waltz, my friend. It's all in the hips. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the you. rise and the fall, it was lovely. Well, there you go. We actually, this is one of the few times that we actually set out to get the answer to a question and cleanly got it. I feel better now about I would get on a 737 Max. He told me I'm good. He told me where to sit. He told me I, I am not likely to get sucked out the window. I, I can drink the water. <laughs> and, I, and I can go tuchus first across the there person next to me as long as I say, I beg your pardon. But it is, I, I it is have funny. all the answers. It is funny, though, when you have an expert on and you're asking questions about on the, the plane. Yeah. I'm sitting with the, I'm the grotesque populace for 99% of the flight. Right, right, when right, you're right. business class, you're going, no, it's yeah. not as, it's, it's better than it's been. Yeah, you got your own bedroom. <laughs> if the people in the back knew how you were living, they'd be even angry. Right. Or as we said angry. on Seinfeld, my, one of my favorite lines was Jerry. We did an episode where Jerry was booked in first class and Elaine is in, is in coach. And she goes up to talk to him and she's barred and they draw the curtains. Right. And, and she gets upset and she turns to the economy crowd and she goes, you know, they're getting cookies up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's why they have the curtain. Yeah, you they bet that's you why they see. have the curtain. Right. You they, when you can't put yeah. your seat back. I actually had. I, I'm thinking of the flights that I had. And I'll make this quick. One was I had when I had an ad agency in Philly, I had to take like a puddle jumper to another city. And it was like an eight seater, 10 seater. And they got all these guys in suits around and with walkie talkies and stuff. And I go, what's going on? And they, they were transporting a mafia Don on the plane. It's a 10 seater. Oh, wow. yeah. So I'm sitting here going, oh my God, oh my God. And eventually they bring a guy who looked deceased. He's in a wheelchair, handcuffed to the wheelchair. They get him out of the wheelchair and like get him on the plane. We all have to wait, all six of us. And they put him down on the plane and handcuff him to the seat. They got FBI around him. I'm saying, this guy, this guy can't stand by himself. What's he going to do? And the great thing was it was maybe an hour, 10 flight. They put me in a the seat. They were back facing and forward facing. Of course, the guy is glaring at me the entire hour oh, and 10 sure. minutes. Yeah. Like he's trying to look at me like, you're going to get, you're going to die when we land. Here's yeah. what's going to happen. It's one of those. Yeah. I'm never so forgetting was, your I, face. <laughs> exactly. I was on a plane that had to turn around because of a bird strike. It hit a giant bird and there was really? blood. Yeah, really? the engine went complete. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's you know that's what took the Sully plane down. A so bird strike. School of geese. Yeah, was that a of school geese. of geese? Yeah, this was yeah. not a school. Was out. It was just the one. Yeah. Wow. I've never. Yeah. I have to say, I have been very lucky. I've I've had uh, a couple of things on flights that were you know a little bump, bumpy, a little scary, but but nothing. I, I have never. And there was actually one time where I landed. Uh, somewhere, and they said, "Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please, when we land and we get to the gate, don't don't get up. Uh, security will be coming on the plane. We ask you to stay in your seats." And I, oh, geez, you know, oh, and I'm I'm up front. I don't know what the hell. I didn't see anything happen. I didn't hear anything. I couldn't hear a commotion. Security comes in. It's like four guys, and they go to the back of this plane. I go, "Oh, I can't wait to see the monster that must be back there that they're dragging out that they have to come on with." You know. And they come out and they're escorting what seems to be a 20-year-old, rather lovely-looking college girl who's going, so British, going, sorry, sorry, everyone, sorry. <laughs> and, and I go, what, what the hell could that be? <laughs> and apparently, I asked the flight attendant, she said, oh, yeah, no, she was a gigantic disruption. Mm. She was a gigantic pain in the ass. It was a political thing, and she was trying to disrupt the flight. And I went, oh, boy. really? Wow, she seemed... She seemed <laughs> We also, by the way, we also had a, a trip to Hawaii and we decided to go to the, the Giga Line. It's when they started doing um, direct flights to Maui. 
because yeah. it always used to be the big island and then you had to take a hopper over. oh i never had that. so we did one of the first direct flights yeah to maui and as we get to Maui, they say, we're not landing at Maui. We can't get the landing gear down. So we have to go to the big island. And they're foaming in the runway. I see the fire engines. They had to, We did the head down landing the whole bit. And right before we landed, because he was going to land on foam, which is not, I don't think, the preferable way, the, we heard the wheels go down. Are you telling me that the Maui airport didn't have a foam contingency? The plane was too big, I guess, and they figured they needed more runway, and they didn't have all of the foaming. I guess because this was new. And there was, was no just... gas station across the street that could have stopped you in a slide? I didn't ask. With my, you know what I was talking to? I was talking to my butthole, because my head was down between my legs going, what am I, what's happening here? Great would vacation. You, it, given the opportunity, would you like to learn to, to fly? A, I took a flying plane? lessons. You took... When was this? I, I have fear of I have great fear of heights, and at You'll the Santa Monica both. Airport, Santa Monica Airport, they had flight less flying lessons. I took two flying lessons in a single single engine plane, and decided that I would probably kill myself, like I do with everything else. I'm the guy who's <laughs> anal, but would go, "Oh my gosh, I forgot that one thing," and I'm up by myself. So I made the decision that I don't need that kind of stress. I don't uh -huh. need to study for more stuff. But it was fun overcoming the fear of heights a bit because yeah. it's, it doesn't happen in a private. I plane never overcame it. I had two, uh, two much. I took hang gliding lessons for no, you're a minute. An idiot. I'm an idiot for, for a, for a single engine. My God. And I, you know, and it started with you 10 feet off the ground and you go about a football field and I go, this is fan. I'm doing this. And then I went off in tandem with a guy and I went, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm never doing this. This is, this is not happening. And then I was in Maui and we took a helicopter tour. Right. And I had the, Best time. You got the earphones. As long as it's moving. Indiana Jones music and it's going. Right. And, you know, it was very exciting. The guy lifted up and he zoomed down a runway. He didn't need to, but he zoomed down the runway and the, the runway gave out and you're over the, the, the shoreline and he turned in the air and banked. And I'm putting my arms out like I'm Superman. And we he lands the thing and I go, I'm, oh my God, you've changed my life. I'm going to learn to fly this. You I'm going to learn how to fly a, a helicopter. And the helicopter pilot says, no, <laughs> don't. Don't. Although Mrs. Bezos, these things, uh, these things should not be in the air. He Mrs. Says, Bezos has a, has a helicopter company. Oh, she good for Mrs. Him. Bezos. She flies. She flies. That's flies great. Him. That's terrific for her. Yeah. So you know, uh, here's the thing that you and I have talked about. It, it is my really the only thing that I get furious about with the airlines, and it's not just airlines, but it's when they overbook a flight. I've booked I, I, a month ahead of time. I've booked a flight, and you get there, and I, I've never not gotten on the plane, but my seat is no longer available. I've been moved because they overbooked the flight. And I go, how do you, what? If you overbooked a flight, have a little plane behind this plane for the 12 you. people you people, overbooked. By the way, and I called ahead of time. I did all the right, I did all the right stuff. I was prepared. Same yeah. thing happens with rental cars. Oh my God. Have, I had my it, son I'm going to name son. it Hertz. Right? Number right? one. No, no, Hertz. they all, please, they all do it. Don't, and get us, thank you having to bleep this out. <laughs> so I'm, I'll, and I'll be sued. Do me a favor. All right, I want to say the name. Somebody? It's number one. He's got one. the money. It's Seinfeld not, it, money. Number one. Um, yeah. So, no. yes. So, you Same go, and, and we say, we want a Chrysler Pacifica for my yeah. son, because he's touring, he needs to, uh, and then you get there that day, and they said, yeah, we don't have it. We don't have it. We don't have go, a why did I, why do we go through this whole deal if yeah. you don't have the car? Hotel, same thing. I showed yeah. up. I landed. My flight was a little late in Chicago. They go, well, we overbooked the rooms, and I, the guy before me, had to leave. It was midnight. He went, oh, oh man, and left, and I looked at the guy and went, you know me. I'm not leaving. So you can tell me you're overbooked from now till the cows come home and the three people behind me are going to be there till morning. I'm getting a room because I booked. And somehow they found a room. I guess if yeah. you're, if there's a fe enough fear, but my God, the overbooked. Can you imagine if they did that well, like is, surgery? This is, again, I mean, not everything comes back to Seinfeld, but it was a great thing where Jerry, you know, booked a rental car and they didn't have the car. And, and the woman says, you know, we know how to hold the reservation. We, we, we know you have a reservation. And, and Jerry had a line that was great. He said, you know how to take the reservation. You just don't know how to hold the reservation. <laughs> the reservation. And that's really the most important part of the registration of the reservation process. The whole anybody can just take them. <laughs> but can you imagine if other people did that? You're wheeling down the hallway, you, you started the anesthesia, and they went, you know what, we're overbooked. Well, we're that's overbooked. The, I mean, can you imagine? Have right. to have the you, surgery. surgery. Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, you can't mm -hmm. have the surgery today. Yeah, or, the surgery you, today. you know, you start in kindergarten uh, this year. No, you know what? We're overbooked. You're going to start next semester. We overbooked. We overbooked, Over, we overbooked the class. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why yeah. not? Why not just no pick room. the profession? Yeah. And yeah. by the way, I had an uncle who used to tip the, one tip the pilots. He would walk in and go, I'm going to give him 50. He'd say, 
If you can get us there 10 minutes early, it's really, it'd be, it'd be great. Schmears the pilots? <laughs> Schmears the Well, that's like, that's like that great story that Billy Crystal tells about the guy who, the, the, we won't name names, but he was flying with a guy and they had huge turbulence. He was, one, he was an agent, not Billy's, right. who was known for being rather gruff and tough yeah. to deal with. And they're flying in, in turbulence. And this guy's in, a big in commercial first class, jet. and he gets up, and he walks over to the cockpit door, bangs on the door. Smooth it the fuck out! <laughs> Smooth it out. Can you imagine? <laughs> You'd be shot today. There would be, wherever the air oh, marshal you is, to, you would know. You, would you wouldn't know get to the door. And by be, the way, I read an article, and I should ask Richard this, that um, flight attendants are trained, supposedly, in how to deal with this stuff, and they all have... Um, some kind of defensive action course too that they all have physical training. What do they have? Krav Maga. I don't. They don't. A pepper they don't spray. Tell, they don't want to as tell you. As far as I know, prepared. they have duct tape. That's what they have. Duct. Tape. They have duct tape and twist ties, and part of Which the I've job learned is from Survivor. You can survive forever with a roll of duct tape. You don't need anything else. But by the way, if I, you have to sit true. on, if you have to sit on somebody because they were unruly. Do they get a refund back for your seat because you didn't sit in the seat? Well, all, that also becomes: do you sit on them face front or, or took us front? Because it, which oh, is rude, no. which is face less down. rude. I'm not face down. Face down. Okay, I don't need sure. to look at somebody while I'm sitting on them. No. Right. That I right, don't know. Right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. All of a sudden they're an ottoman, and I, I don't want to know that. So. Well, all right. Very good. This is what we've accomplished. The skies are safe, ladies and gentlemen. If you make them so. <laughs>